Thank you so much. Um, so I want to um, sort of tell you about this project I've been involved in since uh, around 2018. So this is sort of a long-standing um, collaboration effort with some people in Oslo. Um, it, it is on melanoma. Can I use one of these clickers? This one. Um, but before we get into the melanoma, I want to tell you about a, a success story, uh, and that is ALL in, in children. So ALL stands for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It's, a, it's, a, it's the most common form of leukemia in children. It's the most common form of cancer in children, with around 800 cases in the UK yearly, and around half of those are in children under four. So it's caused by an overproduction of white blood cells in the bone marrow, and these blood cells don't really mature correctly, and it leads to an overcrowding of white blood cells. And it means that the bone marrow struggles to produce other cells that, 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 that the body needs with all sorts of consequences. Uh, this disease used to be um, basically a death sentence, really. Uh, so what I'm showing here is American data from various clinical trials from the 60s all the way up until present day-ish. Uh, and what, it, what I'm plotting is the overall survival curves. And so in the 60s, this, this disease was treated with sort of a combination of various chemotherapies. Uh, these kids, uh, they m mostly all went, in, went into remission from, these, uh, from this treatment, but they basically all relapsed and survival was less than 10%. And over the years, we sort of started introducing more, uh, uh, more treatments for this, uh, including radiation therapy and also intrathecal chemotherapy, which is where they inject uh, chemotherapy directly into the, the spinal fluid. Uh, the bigger success, this big jump, came from something called the berlin frankfurt Münster Regiment. So it's an eight-drug, eight-week uh, induction and consolidation period um, that was quite successful and then further clinical trials has taken this uh, survival curves further up to now have a survival of over 90 percent so overall a massive success story um, now the modern treatment for this consists of sort of three phases there's an induction phase that's meant to sort of induce remission in patients uh, and then the consolidation phase in, intended to, to keep them from relapsing and then finally, there's a, there's, a, there's a long maintenance phase where they're given sort of daily uh, methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy drug, uh, maybe other combinations as well. That goes on for maybe 18 to 30 months. And we can find similar success stories in many other cancers. And so what I'm showing in this plot is the improvement in five-year survival. Uh, this is also American data for various cancer sites. And so we see for prostate cancer, for example, it's increased from an average survival, uh, five-year survival of 67%, all the way up to 993 right? So many, many success stories here. And these successes are all driven by sort of our increased understanding of genetic causes of cancer, uh, but also novel treatments. And by novel treatments, I mean both new drugs, like physically new molecules, but also novel combinations of drugs. Um, additionally, the increased personalization of treatments. So we can now sort of, breast, breast cancer isn't breast cancer anymore. There's like, four, five, ten, however you split them up subgroups, and we can treat all of those sort of with, with um, specific treatment plans. And um, it was pointed out to me also that uh, uh, probably early detection is also a thing here, right? So we're, we're now, we don't have screening programs for some of these cancers, and so we might be able to pick them up earlier than we did before. Uh, what I want to focus on in my talk is specifically this point about new combinations. Um, so this is a a collaboration, a, co a collaboration I've been involved in since 2018. This is the first year of my PhD. I was introduced to these guys, so Jovet Pilar and Robert, who work at the University Hospital in Oslo. And they were working on these large drug sensitivity screens. So they grow cancer cells in the lab, and then they treat them with different chemicals at different doses. And they get these sort of nice dose response relationships. And so we see here, for example, that at low doses of this drug, 100% of the cells are still alive after treatment. And then as you increase the concentration, more and more drug cells are being killed off. And you get these nice sort of smooth um, curves in the monotherapy case or surfaces in the combination case. And they do this for multiple drugs and for multiple cell lines. So you get these really large data sets. Now, these guys were particularly interested in the notion of synergy. Uh, that is that sort of two kind of weak drugs can be somehow combined to boost each other and become super effective. Um, and these combinations have the potential to sort of maybe limit side effects because you can use much lower doses of the, of the drugs themselves to get the same effect. You could also make combinations that selectively only kill, uh, kill and target cancer cells and leaving healthy cells unharmed. And they can also be used to overcome resistance that, that's common with some, many of these modern um, targeted therapies. So just a, sort of a quick sort of uh, talk a little bit about the structure here. I want to tell you a little bit about dose response data and how it's generated and, and how it sort of comes to be. I'm going to tell you about the model we developed to identify synergy from these experiments. 
And then I'm going to apply that model to a large melanoma data set from Oslo and show you some results on that. So the way these experiments work is that they have these small plastic plates that's filled with these um, individual wells. And in each well, they put sort of uh, various drugs at various concentrations. And also they, they, they put uh, cells there uh, in each well, right? And then they leave the cells to grow for a while and, and for the drugs to act. And then they read it off with sort of a plate reader and you get a number associated with each, with each well here. Uh, here we go. And we can use this to, to construct these, uh, these dose response relationships. So on this well, I have some special wells that are my positive controls. In these wells, there's added a chemical that basically kills the cells completely. So it, it gives me a baseline of what complete cell death looks like. And some other wells uh, have nothing added at all. So these are just happy, proliferating, growing cells. Uh, put those two together, I get sort of a, a sort of a zero one relationship where zero means that everything is dead and one means that everything is still alive. And the rest of my blue uh, points here now just correspond to different concentrations. And so I can uh, now introduce some notation here. I'm going to call my concentrations X and I'm going to call my vibrator measurements YI to YN. And they should be sort of ish in this interval, right? They're allowed to deviate outside because we normalize to something like the average of these controls. Uh, but they should be each there. One way this is typically modeled then is to have some sort of function m, uh, typically a parametric function, that's constrained to be in this interval. And then my yi, my viability, are just noisy, uh, noisy um, evaluations of this function. Drug combinations uh, experiments quite similar, but now we do everything on a grid. So now I'm indexing my x i j by the concentration of drug one and concentration of drug two. I do a monotherapy experiment for drug one by this disconnected row, a monotherapy experiment for drug two by this dis disconnected columns, and, they, and then I have some observations for the combined here. I still have my yij coming from some unknown function f, uh, perturbed by some noise, right? Now we tend to think about these um, drug combination dose response function as being composed of two parts. There's a non-interaction part and an interaction part. Now this non-interaction part is meant to sort of, it meant, it meant, it meant to capture almost like a notion of additivity, uh, which we talked a bit about if you were there on Tuesday for Amy's talk, where what do we expect this function to look like if the drugs just acted independently? That's kind of the thing we want to capture here. Now the interaction effect is whatever's left over. So if this is negative, it means we're killing more than we would expect, and we call that effect synergy. <laughs> Uh, so starting to build the model now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, PCR term, which is the uh, the expectation of my F if the drugs acted independently. And at this point, there's many, many different uh, ways you could do this. And um, people like to have these really long uh, arguments about which uh, what is the best way to do this. We do something very simple. So we look at the two monotherapies for drug one and drug two. And then we're going to say at the, the expected combined effect at this uh, concentration here it's just the product of these two monotherapies at the corresponding concentrations. This is sometimes called the bliss independence assumption, because if you interpret your M's as um, probabilities, this is basically the probabilistic interpretation of, of independence. And so building this model up slowly now, we have uh, our Y coming from, uh, by beta measurements coming from this F, this F is decomposed as, so, as such, and this uh, non-interaction assumption is, is like this. And then we have this really, kind of non-linear looking thing here that we're not really sure about. And so we're gonna model that using a Gaussian process. Uh, specifically, we put a Gaussian process prior on this, on this function Z. It's, uh, it's uh, centered at, at zero and has some sort of covariance function uh, kappa. And then because we want everything to be contained within the interval zero one, I'm just gonna squeeze that through a function G. Um, so this is sort of the basic model that we proposed. And we, you know, we wrapped that all up, up into an R package. We implemented it in Stan. And we made a user-friendly R package out of this that we call base synergy. So it just takes this input, some sort of potentially quite messy data set. We allow for a lot of missingness uh, and sparse observations. And we produce um, samples from the posterior distribution of each of these terms. And then the, uh, the thing to do now is that we have, a, we have a model for this and we get full uncertainty quantification for the things we care about. Uh, and we want to use this to, to identify synergy. And identifying C synergy, we're going to do this in two ways. I want to first make an argument that it's basically a model selection kind of thing, where we've done some monotherapy experiments to get our uh, curves for monotherapy of drug one and monotherapy of drug two. And then I'm going to pick a sort of a, a line here and I'm going to create the corresponding P0, this non interaction term. And I get some uncertainty for that as well, right? 
And what I want you to think about now is that, well, if we observe a single pointer now, the task really is to decide, well, is this thing coming from, is this just an outlier from this yellow function? Or does it come from a completely different function that contains this uh, interaction term? And so basically, this is now just a simple sort of model selection thing. We can answer that question using the base factor. Where if we have two models, one where our f of x is just a non-interaction, and one where we include this, this Gaussian process interaction term. Uh, so that is sort of one way of doing this. The other thing I want to talk about is sort of effect sizes, because this will tell you yes or no if there's anything, if, if there is an interaction effect in your experiment. But if those interaction effects are really small, we might not care about them. So we want to do, we want to have some sort of measure that it involves the effect size as well. So this is a, a real uh, data set from this melanoma screen, and I'm showing you the posterior median of the interaction surface. And so you see we have it's mostly flat, centered near zero. There's a big region of synergy. There's this blue contour in the middle here, and then there's some local <laughs> peaks of antagonism at the end here. Uh, and so we want to sort of summarize that by a number. And the way we do that to uh, avoid the synergistic effect and the antagonistic effect cancelling each other out is that we summarize this into two numbers where we integrate over the positive and negative component here. And since we do this at each iteration of our NCMC sampler, we get a full density for the things we care about. So here, for example, we see that there probably is a synergistic effect here that's separate from zero. Uh, but maybe the antagonistic effect is not quite so clear. All right. So returning to the actual application of this. Um, uh, these guys were working on this really big melanoma data set. They had 21 melanoma cell lines and they had two melanocyte derived cell lines. These are basically healthy cell lines. Um, they had 61 drugs of interest and they, did, they wanted to look at every single combination of these uh, for two drugs. So they had 1830 combinations and they wanted to test every single combination on every single cell line they had available. So it's a complete data set in that sense. And so they, they did 44,000 experiments. To, to, to do this. And so we cranked that through our sort of pipeline, our computational pipeline, and we um, used our R package to analyze each experiment. And then we're essentially now trying to hone down where do I have interactions in my data set. We first look at the base factor and trying to do something when it comes to multiple testing, we just set this threshold really high. So a base factor of 100 is sort of called decisive uh, evidence. In this sort of the like Cass and Raftery paper. Uh, and we find 5,000 experiments that pass that. And then zooming in there, we further look at those 5,000 that survived that base factor cutoff. And we look at, well, what are the effect sizes? And we set some cutoffs for the effect sizes. And we categorize experiments as weakly uh, synergistic um, and strongly synergistic and similarly antagonistic. And we arrive at only around 3% of the experiments show really evidence of the, uh, any, any interaction effect present. So one way to visualize this data, which we're also interested in, is we could just plot every drug against every other drug and every cell line and only show the points where it's synergistic or antagonistic. And you should get this sparse cube. This is really difficult to visualize. So, so one thing you could do is you could squeeze it down over the cell lines and you get a plot like this. So what I'm plotting here is every drug in my screen as drug A, every drug as, uh, every drug as drug B, and then I'm coloring them according to synergistic effects and antagonistic effects. And the size of the dots indicates how many cell lines I see that effect in. And so this is a way of uh, looking at it, which allows you to see some patterns. So for example, we have the drug Avagazistat, which seems to be synergistic with a lot of things, right? But not really antagonistic with many things. And so we don't really necessarily have a very good explanation for that, but it's something we do see in the data. Another drug, methotrexate, appears to be antagonistic with tons of things, not really synergistic. Um, rixolitinib doesn't appear to uh, react really with anything, maybe up here a little bit, but not really. Um, that kind of makes sense in this context because it inhibits JAK1 and 2. Uh, these things are only really expressed in immune cells. There's no immune cells here, so that kind of makes sense to us. But to take an example where we kind of feel like we understand what's going on, I'm going to look at this combination. So this is uh, Radusartib, which is the checkpoint inhibitor, and it's highly synergistic in many, many melanoma cell lines with these two drugs, Citrabin and Cladrabin. Now, Radusartib is the checkpoint inhibitor. Specifically, it, it, it inhibits check one. And check one, it does many things in the cell, but one thing it does is that it acts almost like a, like a stopwatch for the, for the cell cycle. 
And so it, it's there to detect potential DNA damage. And if DNA damage has occurred, it stops the cell cycle and gives the cell time to repair that DNA damage before moving on to mitosis. Are these other drugs, citabin and clavulabin, these act as, um, as analogs for the nuclear basis of DNA. So citabin acts as an analog for the A letter in the DNA, and clavulabin acts like an analog for the C letter in the DNA. And these are just similar enough that they can actually enter the DNA during replication, but they're just different enough that it actually doesn't work and it damages the DNA. Um, so what we think is happening here is that we induce a DNA damage using these two chemicals. What happens is that check one is supposed to, de to detect that, stop the cell cycle and give the cell time to repair, but we now also blocked that possibility. So the cell has to move on now with damaged DNA and that kills the cell. That's why we're seeing synergy here. Okay, so having uh, done an example where we feel like we understand something about the biology, we wanted to see if this is just a fluke of the assay or if we can, re if we can reproduce it elsewhere. And so we had some other collaborators that work on these mice model. So essentially, uh, we went to Guy Fu and Gun Hill, also at the University Hospital, uh, and they injected basically mice with these uh, tumors that, 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 that saw synergy for, for this combination. And we had um, sort of many mice, uh, sadly. Uh, we had nine mice that were left, left untreated, uh, eight that only got this check inhibitor, five that got the, only the DNA damaging agent, and eight that got the combination. This is quite recent data. This was, this was done in August. They went through three, uh, three treatment cycles. And basically, this is the results. So on the x-axis here, I have my uh, sort of time since they were injected with these, uh, these tumor cells. On the y-axis, I have the relative tumor volume. And so we see that the untreated, the untreated mice, the cancer keeps increasing. Uh, at the same rate, it increases for those that only got the checkpoint inhibitor and also only those that got the uh, DNA dam damaging agent. But when we do the combination, we see that we retrieve synergy here as well. And so we have an actual combination where we've now been able to actually validate it also in, in mice, which is quite interesting. So just to summarize very quickly, we made sort of a computational pipeline for reliably det detecting synergistic interaction. Uh, we implemented it in a user-friendly R package, and then we applied it to a large melanoma screen, uh, and we are able to find uh, interactions that are reproducible in mice. And I want to sort of, I could have ended there, but I really want to tell you that this isn't the full story, right? So in particular, I want to highlight these guys. So Pilar did tons and tons of work on the experimental protocol. You need really high quality data to be able to do this, to be able to separate a synergistic effect from the noise in the assay. You need really high quality data. And they spent years optimizing this assay. Um, Robert developed this full computational pipeline for how you create the plates and how you do all the bookkeeping. And he made this massive pipeline for this. And I should say that the only thing I've talked about today is this. So this thing is actually much, much larger if you want to do this properly. And that was recently published in, uh, in, in bioinformatics. Um, the final thing I want to say is that we're also interested in many more things here. So we're interested in prediction in this setting, which we have a paper about. We're interested in biomarker detection, where we face the standard challenges of having high dimensional omics data. And then we have a very low sample size per drug combination. Um, we're interested in experimental design, and then we have a big breast cancer screen as well coming. Um, so I should probably th uh, thank all of my collaborators, and in particular, the Rescue Consortium, which is funding all of this. Uh, and our little work package there is, uh, is Paul, Manuela, and Silvia. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Any questions? So we do have a hand raised online again from um, Ayob Say. If you can unmute yourself, please. Yeah, hi. Thanks. Very, again, very nice application of model. Just I got a little bit of problem with the interpretation of interact, interaction. And you said interaction is an added after additive part, which it doesn't mean in the statistic, it's not the meaning of this interaction. So is there any way, is this terminology new or is this statistical interaction? So, yeah, okay, thanks. I can answer that question first. So confusingly, uh, they use, so people that work in this specific field use the term additive to, to mean any sort of, um, we say that a drug combination is additive if it just follows this non-interaction assumption. It's not necessarily that it's like the, the sum of the marginal effects. Usually it won't be. 
Um, and so it, it, it's something, it's a deviation from an additive effect that we, that we term interaction. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not the same as a statistical product of two effects, really. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Yeah, thanks. No worries. Oh, oh, sorry. Thanks. <clears throat> Does your model have the property that if drug A and drug B are exact, in fact, the same drug, then you shouldn't, there's no synergy or the interaction term is, is zero? Uh, no. This specific uh, bliss interaction assumption that we chose does not have that property. So it's one of the critiques that we're often sort of faced with. So why are you using this? It doesn't have this very natural property. The, the reason why we chose it, and there's, there's a couple of reasons why we chose the bliss interaction assumption. One of them is uh, computational, because if I wanted to have a model that had that property in it, I need to do at each iteration uh, of my MCMC sampler, I need to do a numerical solution to a, to a, to a system. Um, and so it becomes very expensive very quickly. I also don't have gradients. So this is implemented in STAM. So I need something that has gradients. And so the, that product thing works quite well. The other point I want to make about that is that I'm not so sure that I, uh, people like to argue about which of these various non-interaction models is best for the drugs you're considering. I don't think the data quality typically is high enough to be able to make a sort of a very, um, harsh decision on that. I, I, I guess that for high throughput screens, I don't necessarily think that it, that it matters that much, to be honest. Yeah, simply because of the noise levels in the, in the assay. Yeah. Thanks, that's really nice. Um, I, I'm interested in any learnings about um, how you would design this study. So for, having done the analysis, if you were designing the study again, what would you do the same and what would you do differently? You know, things like, is the spacing of the doses right? Could you have fewer or less? Could you have an incomplete factorial? You know, are there some drugs you just wouldn't put in because, as you said, there are no immune cells, so certain drugs probably don't, you know, a priori, it seems very unlikely that they, they don't yeah. do much. Yeah. So um, I will say that when it comes to one, th one thing you need to do for synergy screening is you need to make sure that you've, you've covered sort of the active range of the individual drugs. And so if, if one of the drugs is killing sort of absolutely everything at a certain dose, there's no point looking for synergy in that range, right? So you want to cover a range of the dose response function where something is kind of happening. And it shouldn't be nothing happening and it shouldn't be killing everything. It should be somewhere in the middle. And so they spend a lot of time doing just monotherapy ex uh, experiments to calibrate those doses. Um, the other question is, and that is something we have, have looked at. So these guys used a design where they have six concentrations for the monotherapies, and then they use the interior four by four box of that for the concentrations. And so one thing we've been looking into is using this melanoma data set, can we remove parts of that, of that grid and still get something that, that's quite uh, stable and we still find the same effects? And the, the answer is yes. And so going back and, and, and doing this analysis again, which we've now done hundreds of, hundreds of times with various missing patterns, we've settled on now a, a reduced uh, design that looks sort of, it looks almost like a cross um, where we're able to essentially half the number of wells needed, uh, but get similar results. Yeah. Yeah, that's really neat. Thanks. Yeah. And then uh, I should add as well, the, the, uh, the other thing we're interested in is on the, on the drug side of things, right? Do we need to test all the drugs? Are some combinations more informative than others? And so once we have this neat probabilistic model on this, one of the things we, we want to do is to basically do something like Bayesian optimization over the space of all possible combinations, right? Yeah. And so we do have a question online from Sheila, but Sheila, if you're there and you can unmute, can you say your question, please? Yes, in the most recently described mouse experiment, I wondered why the numbers in the four groups were nine, eight, five, eight, which seems a rather strange experimental design. Uh, yes, that is not something I can answer, to be honest. Um, so I'm not sure why it was done like this. Um, I will have to, I, I would have to check with the actual people who did the experiments. So I only recently have seen this data. So I, I just wanted to show that it kind of works. 
I mean, it may be that certain mice died early and were not available for outcome. I, as I said, I, I have no idea. Um, I, I really don't know. I'm sorry. Thank you. Hi, hello, Marianna Nodale from uh, Clinical Trials Unit in Cambridge. A lovely presentation, very clear and fascinating output. Thank you. My question is, uh, so this is like a two-dimensional project. You're looking at a combination of two drugs. Yeah. Would you have faith in going forward and moving this into three drugs, four drugs, and discovering whether all of them work together or how well, you know, how many? So levels. that is something we are interested in. And so we have actually already done this. So if you go on the, on the GitHub page here for this package, mm -hmm. you will find a version of it that also has a, a three drug combination. Those data sets are usually much rarer mm -hmm. and they're not done that often. Um, but it is sort of computationally, it's perfectly feasible to extend this model in that, in that dimension. And we have done that for three drugs. There's much less data out there to actually apply it to. But we do have our, our same collaborators in, in um, so where are they, Jorvet and Pilar. They looked into that specifically. Uh, um, one of the other members of this group uh, called Mary Ann did that for breast cancer, for triple negative breast cancer. And so she wanted to see if, if, if a triple combination targeting each of the triples and the triple negatives would give you a synergistic effect. And I think those findings initially were quite promising but that uh, some of the clinicians are really skeptical about that combination of drugs that we found, because just clinically it might not be, it, it can be quite deadly really, right? So there's, there's a lot of steps going from doing this in vitro in cells to thinking about doing anything in a patient, right? Yeah. That, 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 that's a big leap, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.